edge of the world. Or I should say, a language on the edge of the world, because actually the question here is very important, because most of the time Faroese is put on a periphery, as are the Faroe Islands. But today I want to put it centre stage, and to look at the history behind the language on the Faroe Islands. Now first of all, the Faroe Islands are fairly obscure for most people. They're a very interesting and beautiful place, but what most people might know about it is that there are only 50,000 people living on the islands. That's in contrast to the 70,000 sheep. And actually, this is a connection that goes right the way back, because the name Furrier actually comes from the Old Norse words Fyr and Oyar, which together mean the Sheep Islands. And actually, for us linguistic nerds, the whole term Faroe Islands is a little bit repetitive, because the O actually already comes from the Old Norse word for islands, so there's no need to repeat islands. For most people though, the Faroe Islands are somewhere they haven't really thought much about at all. And my good friend Stefan from the Faroe Islands, who was a great help in making this video, told me once that when he was in Newcastle, he just explained to a local lass where he was from, and then she asked him the famous question of, but you don't look very Egyptian. So most people aren't too aware of where the Faroe Islands are, and certainly not of the linguistic history that can be found there. But before I get into that, who am I? Well, I'm behind the History with Hilbert YouTube channel. My name is Hilbert, and I look at a lot of history and languages and other things in my videos. I'm an undergraduate studying Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic at the University of Cambridge. My linguistic background is in Dutch and in English, and I've been a student of Old English and Frisian, which are the most relevant languages to this, as well as a year of Old Norse, which was particularly helpful in trying to understand some of the Faroese. And of course, I'm a lifelong history and languages nerd, which is why I love this kind of thing. So why am I looking at this topic today? Well, there are several reasons. One is that I've actually just come back from a week studying bumblebees in the Faroe Islands, which is a little bit different from my normal history and languages pursuits, but this is in aid of my dad, who you can see there on the left, very proud after having caught his first bumblebee in Porshaun, the capital, because bumblebees are starting to spread through the islands, which is a completely unrelated project, but also very interesting. Nevertheless, while I was there, the language caught my attention, and I wanted to explore a little bit more. So more, some more reasons why I'm looking into this today is because it's a language that doesn't often get much consideration within the linguistic community. If you look at the other Scandinavian languages, and even in terms of the insular North Germanic languages, Icelandic takes most of the credit there. But actually contrasting and comparing with the situation in the Faroe Islands can make a really interesting case study. It's also true that its position so far north in the North Atlantic makes it seem very isolated, although looking at its linguistic history makes it clear that it's its connection to other places rather than its isolation that have made Faroese the language that it is today. So let's first of all take a look at where the Faroe Islands are. They're situated up here in the North Atlantic. They're about 690 kilometers away from Iceland, which is situated to the west, 750 kilometers from the British Isles, which are somewhere to the southeast, and about 840 kilometers away from Norway, which is due east. So let's first take a look at the Scandinavian connection, because while Norway is the furthest away of the closest countries that it's close to, it is one of the most important for its linguistic history. This is certainly the case because the first testified explorers to come to the Faroe Islands were Norsemen. And this is why Faroese is today a North Germanic language, which you can see. It's often split into the groups of West and East, and within that it falls into the Western North Germanic languages with Norwegian Icelandic as well. It is sometimes split further into the insular and continental, in which case it makes up the insular North Germanic languages with Icelandic. But the reason for that I will explain a little bit further when we get on to the linguistic history. So they first come to the Faroe Islands around the start of the 9th century. And these were largely people from Norway because the Norwegians were crossing the sea to get to places like Shetland and Orkney. And so when they were blown off course, they found the Faroe Islands and started to settle it as well. Now, at this time, the North Germanic languages looked a little bit different than they do today. And we largely talk about two distinct groups. One is called Old West Norse and the other is called Old East Norse. And around this time, they start to really diverge from one another. But we're likely talking more about 
two dialects of a similar recognisable language rather than two hard and fast different languages at the time and they're often used together just as Old Norse, although there are dialectual differences between them that will become important later on. And so the oldest document from the Faroe Islands is written in a kind of later Old Norse that shows a lot of similarities to the same language being written in Western Norway at the time, remembering that these had both come from the Old West Norse dialect of the Old Norse dialect continuum. It's a very interesting letter and actually the, its name is the Seyabrauve in modern Faroese, whereas at the time it might have been pronounced more like Salvabrefe. So you can see that the sounds have shifted quite a bit since the time of Old Norse being spoken in the Faroe Islands. It's called the Sheep Letter and it concerns all sorts of laws to do with sheep and where they can graze and whatnot. So even back then, of course, it was called the Furia. It's the Sheep Islands. So sheep were very important and it's not a mistake or a coincidence, I should say, that the first document is concerning sheep. And it was found and is uh, talking about Chirchibur. That's where we think this was written. Of course, the Chirchu is talking about a church. And so often writing would go hand in hand with the church. And the pharaohs were, of course, Christian by this time because it was 1298 when this document has been dated. And you can see certain features appearing, certain expressions and words that are characteristically Faroese rather than being Norwegian or being Icelandic. And of course, in Iceland, there was a lot more writing going on in manuscript production at this time. And so we can start to talk about old Faroese from this point on. Get a second snapshot into the development of Faroese from a little bit later called the Husawika Brovena in modern Faroese and potentially spoken more at the time as Husa Fikar Brovena, depending on whether sound shifts had happened already or not. And these are the letters about Husawik in the Faroe Islands that you can see here. So again, we get this concentration around these population centers and these letters were concerning again legal matters and that's what they were using the old Faroese language to describe and it was written around 1403 and we can see the language having developed further. I'll talk about exactly which changes were occurring in just a little bit but first I want to take a look at the Irish connection because of course the Scandinavians had come over and it's a North Germanic language that all makes sense but now we get influence from another language. Now when I'm talking about the Irish connection I should point out that I'm talking both about Irish from Ireland and specifically Northern Ireland at this point which of course doesn't correlate to the modern country but rather the geographic north of the island of Ireland as well as the west coast of Scotland because at the time these were a similar and related people speaking a Guadalic language so related to Scots Gaelic and Irish at the time and correlating often to the kingdom of Dal Riada which stretched across both sides of the Irish Sea because these peoples had an influence on the Faroe Islands, the population and also the language. Now most of the time when we think how did Irish and Scottish people get to the Faroe Islands, the idea straight away is that they were all slaves being taken from the these places by Norsemen going to the Faroe Islands. It's the classic image of the Vikings coming along and taking away mostly young women as slaves and then settling down with them in the Faroe Islands. And there is certainly a basis for this. It's quite possible that a lot, if not most, of the admixture in the DNA and in the language is because of slavery. Certainly if we look at mitochondrial DNA that matches those of peoples living in the Hebrides and in Ireland today, those on the Faroe Islands, it's 83%. Mitochondrial DNA comes from the mother side and then all the way back. And that's 83% matching with those in Scotland and Ireland. Whereas if you look at the Y chromosome from the father side, it's only about 13%. So that means there were far more women coming from Ireland and Scotland that then gave their DNA into the Faroese population than men. And if you then look at mitochondrial DNA and matching with the population in large Norway, which is where most of the settlers will have come from, it's only about 17%. Whereas the Y chromosome, so from the males, is about 87%. So we're looking at a population that was largely male coming from Norway, so speaking Old Norse, but largely female coming from places like the Hebrides, the Western Isles, and from Ireland. So this is very interesting, but it's not the only explanation that it was only slaves. Of course, 
in Ireland at the time, there were several areas where the Norse were in control. These were especially cities or long forts initially in places like Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, Cork and Limerick. And of course, in these places, many Norse would come and they would intermarry and integrate with the local Irish population. And this gives rise to a term called Hiberno-Norse, where you have a mixed culture of Norse and of Irish or, of course, across the sea in Scotland, similar things were happening. And so you get people that were genetically, linguistically and culturally a mix of both Scandinavian and of Irish. And this could then account for the fact that there were people of mixed heritage coming from these Norse colonies along the west coast of Scotland and from Ireland to the Faroe Islands and contributing their DNA into the gene pool, which might be why we see this split between the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA. But still, it's very interesting to look at those demographics. Now, while this is an aside and a more historical and genetic point, we must also ask the question of if there were lots of people from Ireland and Scotland coming over old Irish speakers, how did this influence the language, the Old Norse language that was being spoken by those coming over from places like Norway and some others maybe from Denmark and Sweden? Well, there are some very interesting clues that the Celtic languages did influence the Faroese language. One of these is in place names. So quite a few of the place names of some of the islands and also of the towns like Mütchenes, Störa and Litladimun and Archer are all perhaps coming from the old Irish language. And as you can see, they're spread out through the Faroe Islands rather than concentrated in one area. Now, first, let's take a look at Mütchenes, which it's possible that it comes from Much and Inish, which in Irish means something like Pig Island. It might be a bit strange to have a pig island, especially considering we're in the sheep islands from Old Norse. But actually, their word was something like a sea pig was for a whale. And of course, you get lots of whales coming across the North Atlantic around the Faroe Islands at the time. So it's possible that that's why Mütchenes got this name. But it's interesting then that it came from this Celtic etymology rather than an Old Norse etymology. The place name Archish, which is just south of the capital Turshaun on Stromoy, is probably related to this Old Irish word, which meant something like a summer pasture or a summer meadow, which perhaps again gives a clue as to what these Celtic speakers were doing within the community at the time. If they were indeed in bondage and they were looking after the flocks as shepherds, as we read in the Icelandic uh, sagas at the time that the often the, the slaves and the thralls who were from Ireland and are given Irish names there were looking after the flocks. Perhaps something similar was happening in the Faroe Islands. Now we also get records from personal names. Doimun, as in the place of the two islands, one being the small and the other the large, is most likely from an Irish personal name. We also get one of the first recorded individuals settling there called Grimur Kamban. Now, what's interesting is that Grim is the same place name element as is found in Grimsby, where it means Grim's town. But Grim actually is, of course, an Old Norse name. But whereas Kamban, this Cam part comes from a Celtic element. And what it means is the crooked one. And actually, this crooked meaning cam can also be seen in the name of two large Scottish clans today in the form of Campbell and Cameron, where they respectively mean the crooked mouth and the crooked nose. So it's interesting that while there was an individual with an Old Norse first name, his surname or his epithet, so to say, would be a more accurate description, is coming from an Old Irish word instead. There are also quite a few loan words from Old and from Middle Irish that you can see here. And again, the kinds of words that are being used makes, makes it again a possibility that it was indeed Irish people who were looking after the flocks, potentially as a kind of servant or slave for the masters, for the Old Norse speaking masters from Scandinavia, if that is indeed the case. On one level, it's also true, and this is something that I thought when I first heard Faroese spoken, is that in terms of pronunciation, especially when compared to Icelandic, it does sound a little bit Irish. A lot of the very kind of harsh and characteristic sounds from Old Norse, which I'll talk about in just a little second in more detail, seem to have been mellowed out and changed in a way that makes it a little bit more like Irish or Scots Gaelic. If it was heard, say, through a wall and it was a bit muffled, it might even be confused with that. 
which is very interesting. And the possibility is that if large numbers of Irish speakers were picking up Old Norse, as often is the case when you're learning a new language, as many of you will know, it's very hard to get the right pronunciation when you're learning a new language. And people will often be able to tell that you have learnt it as a second language because you'll retain the accent. Now, if this happened on a large scale with lots of Irish speakers learning Old Norse, it might even be the case that the language of Old Norse being spoken on the Faroe Islands adapted and changed to actually take on the accent of people learning that new language and so take on a kind of Irish accented Old Norse, which may be what occurred in the Faroe Islands, which is very interesting and is also a parallel to Icelandic, because that is something that's quite different from Icelandic, is the pronunciation. Although Iceland also had quite a large admixture, certainly in terms of genetics, but we can assume also linguistically from Celtic speakers. So it's interesting to see that those two diverged in that way although the two languages are similar in many respects, and they both went through a sound change that become known as the conditioned consonant change. And what this essentially meant was that the HV became a KV at the start of words. The HV was found in a lot of Old Norse words, and its equivalent in Old English was the HW. So, for example, Huat, which is the first word of Beowulf, is now the modern English what, because they switched around. But the change that occurred in the dialects of Old West Norse, the insular dialects, so in Icelandic and in Faroese, they both had this conditional consonant change, is that it became a kv. So you can actually see this in action if you compare the Norwegian phrase for what is your name, Varhetadu, to the Faroese, kvusu tu. You can see that the kvusu, even though it's still written with the HV, has got a different sound attached to it now due to this difference. Another big difference actually with Icelandic is the dental fricatives. What's interesting is that these two, they're called ev and thorn, are both still written in Icelandic and in Faroese. Or I think the thorn is a bit archaic in Faroese now, but the ev is certainly still written. However, these noises are the voiced dental fricative is found in the, whereas the unvoiced dental fricative is found in a word like thought. What's interesting is that they both are retained in Icelandic and Faroese, but actually with Faroese, there is no ascribed phenome. So you actually don't have the sound of the the or the th in Faroese anymore, even though it's still written there, which is very different to Icelandic although the two do share a case system. And this is something that sets it apart from the other languages and why uh, in the North Germanic branch and is why it's often put in the insular category on its own because of the fact they still have these other letters that most of the other Scandinavian languages have got rid of and because they still have a case system which makes it more similar to Old Norse which was also a language with a case system as opposed to Danish, Swedish and Norwegian which all don't have case systems anymore. Now a difference between Faroese and Icelandic is also found in the fact that for the same sound the Icelanders use an umlaut o whereas the Faroese use a slashed o and this is because of influence of Danish, which if you speak Danish, then you'll know that they also use this slashed O in Danish as opposed to the umlaut O. And part of this is because in 1380, the Faroe Islands stopped being a Norwegian possession and became part of the Danish kingdom. And this is important linguistically because, of course, before this, the language being spoken on the Faroe Islands, as we saw in the sheep letter and the letters about Husuik was that they were quite similar to the language being spoken in Western Norway at the time, although in 1380 this really starts to change. And unfortunately for the nascent Faroese language, the Danish administration did things a little differently to the Norwegian administration. And what this meant for the language was that actually Faroese became consigned to a spoken language, the language of the home, whereas Danish became the language of the administration, of education and of the church. And this was all the domains in which one could find written language at the time, so like the documents and law codes and things like that. And so actually Faroese disappears as a written language for around 300 years when the Danish take over. Now, that's not strictly speaking true. And this is because if we look at a different avenue of writing, 
then we can find evidence of some Faroes at some point in between the gap, although granted it's not much. This is in the form of runestones. Now, before you get too excited though, I should mention there are only three runestones found on the Faroe Islands. Churchubur, Sandafoger and Famian. But these runestones, which you can see Sandafoger and Churchubur there, these are from the earlier period. So the one in Churchubur is from the Viking Age. Sandafoger is from the 13th century, so a little after the Viking Age. And again, interesting for looking at the development of the language. But the one that's very interesting is the one found at Famian, which is on Suroi. Now, this one is very interesting because actually it was erected and has been dated to around 1538. Now, of course, when we think of rune stones, we think of the Vikings, we might think of pagans and magic and, and blood and that kind of thing. But actually, this rune stone in 1538, at the same time in England, Henry VIII was on the throne and they were still writing in runes at the time. They were still hammering runes into a stone in Famian, which is incredibly interesting. Um, both because it's a runestone that's found so late and the fact that they still felt that they could express in Faroese on this runestone. And of course, this is again old old Faroese and there's not much written and actually what's written is very unclear to read and so I've not provided a transcription because actually the guesses are all over the place for what it means. But you can look up the transcription if you're interested yourself and try and figure out what's being written there. And but apart from that one little smidge, there's nothing else being written in Faroese at the time. And you might wonder if a period, there's a period of about three centuries where there's nothing being written in a language, how does it continue to survive? What effect does that have on a language? Well, one way in which it survived was through a very rich tradition of folklore. There were lots of folk songs, folk ballads, and, and folk poems about various places in the landscape. And for the majority of people, Faroese was still the spoken language, whereas Danish had taken over every realm of writing. And Danish was the language taught in schools and for officials and that kind of thing. But the tradition of folklore and telling these stories and these poems and, and songs, often having meters that had to be adhered to meant that the language was a bit more conservative and survived a bit better than perhaps if it hadn't have had this rich tradition of oral storytelling and oral poetry and so it continued and actually it's through this medium of these folk stories and folk tales and different dialects that an individual called Jens Christian Swabel actually started to collect all of these stories together and to collect these different dialect words and different dialect variations and write them down at the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century because he was worried that the Faroese language was going extinct, that people would stop speaking it within his lifetime or the next lifetime along. And it was because of this that more work started to be done with Faroese from native Faroese speakers who wanted to see the situation with their language change as they got into the 19th century. In 1823, the Danish Bible Society printed a diglot of the Gospel of St. Matthew with, on the left-hand side, Faroese, and on the right-hand side, Danish. And this was, of course, the first time in hundreds of years, well, that we have evidence for that Faroese was written down, but then they used an orthography similar to that of Danish. The real big breakthrough was in 1854 with a man called Wenceslaus Ulrikus Hammershype. And this is a brilliant name, first of all. He's also got a great beard for the period. But what's important is that he actually created an orthographic system for Faroese. And that essentially means that he wrote down how to spell these different words. It was a spoken language at the time, but he then standardized a written form. And he did this by working with Jorn Sigurdsson, who was an Icelander. He had written the orthography for Icelandic and was uh, um, a prominent Icelandic nationalist and wanted to see more of the Icelandic language being used and written down and continued as opposed to the Danish, who were also rulers in Iceland at the time. And what he did was to actually create an orthography that was based both on the Old Norse and very similar to that of Sigurdsson's Icelandic orthography, which is why Faroese looks very similar on paper to Icelandic, but also to incorporate all of these various and beautiful dialects from across the islands so that they could all be written down and preserved at the same time. But what this means is that written Faroese is quite a different beast to spoken Faroese 
and can give you a real headache if you're a tourist and trying to figure out a little bit about the language. But it does show the very interesting etymology of the words by tracing it back to the Old Norse, which is something that I found particularly fascinating when looking at um, written Faroese. 1937 was a breakthrough year for proponents of the Faroese language, as it was the year in which Danish was replaced as the official language of education in place of Faroese. A year later, in 1938, the official language of the church, which had all been in Danish apart from if you specially requested to have a service in Faroese, was completely switched over to being conducted in Faroese as well. Although the, in Denmark they were still unwilling to give up the fact that the government business had to be conducted in Danish, as the Faroe Islands were, and still are, a possession of Denmark. Although this would change because of the next group that I'd like to focus on, and this is the English connection. Because English has also influenced the Faroese language. And actually, this goes way back to the Viking Age already, because the old English language, so that being spoken by the Anglo-Saxons who were living in parts of England and southern Scotland at the same time as those first Norse settlers were coming across the North Atlantic in the early 9th century to the Faroe Islands and you had the Irish coming from there, you probably also had some influence from Old English and this likely came through the church because the Pharaohs were Christianized in around the 10th and 11th centuries, probably you get some earlier stuff in the 10th and then properly in the 11th century. And during this time, many of the ministers coming over were Anglo-Saxon and English, especially when you consider the fact that Knut had his North Sea Empire, which incorporated Denmark, Norway and England. They often wanted to move away from getting German from Hamburg, Bremen, these monks and ministers from there, but rather they wanted English ones because of political maneuvering and alliances. So it's quite possible that there were Englishmen coming to the Faroe Islands, these Anglo-Saxons coming there and working in some capacity with the church. And it seems that the loan words that actually came from Old English rather than modern English like Quitsuna and Saul were words for soul and these are clearly related to the church and evangelizing from anglo-saxon missionaries there although let's jump about a millennium forward in time to 1940 during the second world war when denmark was occupied by the germans and so the british in a preemptive measure occupied the faroe islands themselves and stationed forces there and it's because of this that there has been an english influence on the faroese language this is found in words like teenager, which means teenager. You can almost hear it, except notice that the orthography is then Faroese rather than just taking the English word. And actually, when I asked my friend Stefan about this, he said, what on earth does this mean? And I said, oh, it's teenager. And he says, oh, we use this in spoken form all the time, but never written down, which is interesting how these loan words play into things. There's also fitter, which means fit as in nice. My personal favourite of the words that entered Faroese from English at this time, however, has got to be Fokauer, which comes from the word knackered or, or another word in English, because I think it's very funny how this would have entered the language. Perhaps if the Faroese had seen some British soldiers carrying something and then one of them slipped and fell into the water and they, they heard the word and then decided, actually, let's use this and add it into our own language as Fokauer which is a great one to remember. It's also very important for political reasons because in 1948, just after the British occupation, when the Faroese had actually been able to use their own flag and they were, of course, the only part of Denmark that, uh, that and Iceland that weren't taken by the Germans and Iceland then declared independence following the Second World War. This actually led to, in the Faroe Islands, the Home Bill Act, the Home Rule Act. And in 1948, Faroese, as part of that, became the official national language of the Faroe Islands. Although it wouldn't be until 1984 that the main media station would transfer from using Danish as its language to Faroese. So in some areas, Danish was still actually the the more important language in some ways in the Faroe Islands, while now it really has shifted in favour of the Faroese language. 
What's interesting is that most people on the Faroe Islands, so certainly in schools, children will still learn Danish, and most of them can speak Danish. And actually, 5% of the island's inhabitants are Danes who speak Danish as a first language, although it is considered as a foreign language by the Faroese. Although, what's also interesting is that I heard a few times some, either a tourist or someone, a Danish person living on the island would speak Danish and then someone from the Faroes, a native Faroese, would re reply in Faroese and they can normally understand each other quite well, especially if that Danish person has lived there and can understand Faroese, then they can really communicate quite easily with one another. There is actually a fun term which is Götudansk, which means something like street Danish, which is the kind of Danish spoken by the Faroese because you can always hear if someone is from the Faroe Islands and speaking Danish because their Danish is less like that in Denmark and more like the Faroese language. So they have their own term for it. And specifically on the island of Suroy, the dialect there has been very much influenced by Danish loan words and the Danish accent. So it's a very particular dialect that others from the Faroe Islands will straight away pick up on and understand as being an individual from Suroy. Today, modern Faroese speakers are still left with a kind of linguistic hangover for the fact that Danish was for so long the dominant language on the island, and a lot of what are called Danicisms exist, which is where especially new terms would come in through Danish and would then be adopted by the population. On the other side of that, you have what the Icelanders did a lot to become, to let's say create a more pure language, it's called a, a puricism, that they would take words and they would make their own Icelandic equivalents from them. And actually Faroese has borrowed quite a few Icelandic words for terms that they would otherwise have borrowed from Danish, and sometimes several words exist for a similar concept, one coming from Danish and another being borrowed from Icelandic. Now some people will prefer one method of borrowing words, having these loan words to another, whereas others think that actually they should do it on a Faroese basis, because neither Icelandic nor Danish at the end of the day is Faroese. There are also words of course coming in from English that are being taken over, especially words to do with technology like email, whereas others prefer to use, again, more Faroese or to borrow words from Icelandic instead. So this is a great debate that's going on within Faroese, and what's interesting actually is that modern Faroese speakers, so the younger generation, tend to be moving away from words borrowed from Danish and towards using words that are more, quote-unquote, purely Faroese in an attempt to keep their language Faroese and not let it be diluted by Danish, as has been the case throughout history. So perhaps in 50, 60 years time, someone else looking at the history of the Faroese language will have a whole new chapter to tell. But this is where I am going to wrap up. So let's take a look at the language on the edge of the world, Faroese. So when we're looking at Faroese, it comes about largely from a group of Old West Norse speakers, probably if we're looking at the genetic studies, largely males, largely from Norway, but that it also then mixed with a group of largely females speaking Old Irish. And that, of course, their joint generation that came next would have both the influence of the mother's Old Irish and her Old Irish accented Old Norse and the Old West Norse spoken by their fathers. Of course, this is a large generalization, but it's an interesting prospect to look at. Later on, we get the lack of a strong written tradition, as is seen on Iceland. And from the post-16th century, of course, we have that one runestone, Famian, which is 1538. But already we have the last written letters and documents coming from a little bit earlier. We get a very strong Danish influence on the language. And this certainly molded Faroese, which only had a spoken form for several centuries and made it a lot more distinct from what had been very similar to the language spoken in Iceland and Western Norway before. Now, the revival of Faroese as a written language comes in the 19th century with the domains of education, of the government and of the church all switching from Danish to Faroese and then even later others like that of the official language of the Faroe Islands and the media coming a little bit later on. So that's been a very quick whistle-stop tour of some of the debates surrounding the linguistic history of Faroese. There's lots more to be said on many of these different topics and I can look into making videos on a few of them. 
particularly things on the earlier side is what I'm more versed on. So looking at the interaction between Old Irish and Old Norse would be interesting, as well as some of the things about the runestones on the Faroe Islands and how they differ from runestones in continental Scandinavia. And of course, the fact that there are no runestones on Iceland. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Check out the other stuff that the Polyglot Conference has got on. It's really a great initiative. And I'm really glad that I've been asked to do another talk here again. Hopefully next year it will be in person once the COVID situation has been dealt with. But we will wait and see. And in the meantime, we'll keep studying our languages and keep studying our history. And we'll all get through. So thank you very much for watching. You can always reach me on my email, which is historywithhilbert at gmail.com. And there will be a chance and a space to ask questions, although I'm not exactly sure how that'll work yet. I will do my best to get back to any questions people have about Faroese and this video. So until then, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.